Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by Johnny Incorporated. Today's guest is an award-winning costume designer for film and television. At the age of 18, she moved to New York City to pursue a career in fashion, where she interned with Betsy Johnson and took night classes in fashion construction techniques at Parsons School of Design. In 2015, she completed her first feature film as a costume designer, Jean of the Joneses, by Stella McGee, which premiered at South by Southwest. In 2017, she designed the biopic J.T. Leroy, starring Kristen Stewart, Laura Dern, and Diane Kruger. The film closed the Toronto International Film Festival, and her work gained attention in The Hollywood Reporter as a costume movie to watch at the festival. In 2020, she won her first award, the Canadian Alliance for Film and Television Costume Arts and Design Award for Excellence in Contemporary Costume Design, following her work on the Fox Searchlight Pictures hit blockbuster film, Ready or Not, which as an aside, I own, I've probably seen it 10 times, it's fantastic. In 2021, she was honored with the same award again for her work on Blumhouse's The Craft Legacy, a reboot of the 1990s film The Craft. Her most recent credits include the Netflix series Sex Life, starring Sarah Sahi and produced by Academy Award winner Miles Dale and Peabody Award winning showrunner Stacey Rookheiser, as well as Warner Brothers' 8-Bit Christmas, which I just watched, What a Delight, starring Neil Patrick Harris, now streaming on HBO Max. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome the award-winning costume designer Avery Pluiz to the Designing Hollywood podcast. Welcome to the show. It's a great honor to speak with you today. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I got to say, I, I mean, from reading up on your background, you you seem to have known what you wanted. I mean, setting off on this path uh, at 18, was this something that you, you always wanted to do? And uh, was it was it a passion of yours from an early age? Yeah, um, I've always loved clothes and fashion since I was little. I grew up in a, my dad's a packaging designer. His dad's an industrial, or was, he's um, passed since, but uh, an industrial designer. My mom's an artist. I kind of grew up in this really unique creative environment, um, but my dad's also a businessman. And so it, it, uh it has it has really helped in my career because movie making is such business meets the arts right um with so i'm very grateful for that but yeah i you know my mom started buying me fashion books when i was i think six and um i had like my my library that's now my kit i've had since i was a kid a lot of it um yeah i've always been very into clothes. I've always wondered why someone was wearing something or where they got it and how they got it. And I didn't really realize what costume design was, I think, until my early 20s. Um, mm. I, di I didn't really put the I didn't put the puzzle pieces together. I grew up watching, you know, old classics, old Hollywood movies with my mom. Um, and I've always been kind of enthralled by it. But I just it I thought I wanted to be like a couture dress designer. Um, and then the recession hit and it was, you know, very challenging. And so I was just willing to try anything. And I had my first day on set and I was like, oh, this is home. Um, and so it's just kind of been, you know, uh, it's been love at first sight or it was love at first sight. And I've been here since. So, yeah. Well, in talking to other costume designers, a lot of them stress uh, when you when you're first starting out that it's really important to learn the basics yeah. and you know reading about how you went in to learn about construction and you were you you were getting a formal education about the very basics of of making clothes which I think is vital these days a lot of people don't want to put in the time uh, to learn those things but they're going to serve you I would imagine throughout your entire career was that a conscious choice on your part or were you were you advised to do that because of your background no you know um I started sewing when I was eight and then oh, I wow. when I was in yeah when I was in high school um I went to a performing arts high school and I was a visual arts major but I really was like kind of a 
a bad student. I did not like <laughs> being at school. And I, I could kind of talk my way in and out of any scenario. Like I, I remember when I was in grade 10, um, we had a class project where we had to do a book report on 10 Little Indians, the play. Sure. And I convinced my English teacher to let me do illustrations and descriptions of what the characters would wear and why instead of doing the book report. And so, and I recently found those illustrations and it's so funny to me because I'm like, you've always been a costume designer. You just didn't know that's what it was. But, um, right. and then when I was about 16, I started taking proper sewing lessons and fashion um, classes and I learned how to drape. And so I knew how to, I knew construction very well by the time I was probably about 18. And then when I, mm. I moved to New York and I was interning and then taking night classes. Um, yeah, I think it's very important. And I'm always shocked when I meet young costumers who don't want to learn how to sew or don't take the time to do it because I've always been the type of person that wants to know everything. And, you know, I want to have all the tools in my toolbox. And to me, that's like, you know, if you want to be a costumer and you don't have sewing skills, it's like not having a hammer in your right. toolbox. It's like the basic 101. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Well, you said, you know, you, you watch classic Hollywood movies with your mom. What were some of your, you've worked a lot in horror, which is a genre I think that I'm quite partial yeah. to, but what were, what were some of your influences? What were some of the movies that you watch with your mom that inspired you? Um, I love Shirley MacLaine. So, uh, Irma Ledoux, uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Sweet Charity yeah. is one of all time. I just think directed it's, by Bob Fosse. Yeah. One of my favorite Bob directors. Fosse. Love Bob Fosse. Um, I was also really into musicals when I was younger. I just love, um, getting lost in a world that, you know, someone has created and Bob Fosse, I think was one of the greats in that regard. Um, so yeah, those were two. Um, what else? I mean, every Marilyn Monroe movie I watch. Um, I also love James Bond. Um, during the <laughs> love Bond. Um, but yeah, we had like a we had a, a kind of mom and pop vintage movie store at the top of our street, and so my mom would take me there, and we just rent movies. So. Um, oh, and What a Way to Go, which is a horrible B movie, but one of my favorite costume movies. Um, yeah, so I, the, I would say Shirley MacLaine uh, is a. I love her, um, and Liza Minnelli too. Oh, Cabaret, yeah. yeah. Oh, another um, Bob Fosse film. Another great, another, yeah, great Fosse, Fosse movie. Yeah, so Bob Fosse is a director I love. Um, All that jazz yeah. is one of the most for me in my life. One of the most influential movies I've ever seen which he also obviously directed. Such a, the best way to describe that movie is just like the best acid trip kind of. It's yeah. Just, it yeah. made me want to become a film editor. You know, <laughs> so that's the first time I saw a movie. I'm like, film editing is magical. Now I would be remiss if I did not ask you, who is your favorite James Bond? Oh. I know it's putting you on the spot, but. I think Sean Connery. Right answer. <laughs> I mean, talk about clothes. No one wore a three-piece suit the way Sean Connery. His his yeah. gray gray three-piece suit and Goldfinger. I mean, I was going to say Goldfinger. I think is my favorite. Yeah, and the yeah. clothes in that between Goldfinger's clothes himself, Odd Job, Pussy Galore, Bond. There's yeah. some great great costumes in that movie. Yeah. yeah. So but yeah, during the pandemic, I watched every single one in order. Um, <laughs> A woman after my own heart. Now, did you see No Time to Die, the latest I movie? Did. I just did, yeah. What'd you think? Uh, I thought it was really beautiful, and uh, I love the costumes. Mm -hmm. I uh, thought Rami Malek was insane in the best way, and it, he it, it actually reminded me of Brian Fuller. I, he it had kind of a that vibe with uh, Rami. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It it I just want to make a James Bond film. That's like that's 
that's up on the the goal list for me. But yeah, no, it was it was it was good. I mean, it could happen. You know, they're going to have to start start again, to rebuild the franchise <laughs> again. Well, I'm very curious to see who's going to be next. Very yeah, curious. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's funny to hear. Obviously, when I was a kid, Bond was a a a mainstay because it was we only had like three channels and it would air and every kid watched James Bond. And I kind of feel that, you know, a lot of people don't watch classic cinema anymore. Like, you, yeah. you know, you mentioned Sweet Charity, you mentioned Cabaret. It, I'm hard pressed when I talk to people. It, it's frustrating that people don't go back and watch even like the Hollywood greats or noir films like Sunset Boulevard or or All About Eve, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Do you, when you go back and you're watching classic cinema, are, are you getting, like when you're working on contemporary horror films like The Craft, you know, you're dating, dating, you're not dating yourself, but you're, you're dressing characters that are supposed to be contemporary, but can you, do you take inspiration from classic cinema in order to sort of bring it into the modern, modern day? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there are principles that um, of costume design just overall that I try to kind of follow, um, you know, telling story through color, um, creating individual characters and arc. Um, and I think something that's important for me and that I learned from working for Chris Hargadon when I worked on Hannibal was, you know, you want to bring kind of a timeless element to what you're creating that mm. sometimes doesn't always necessarily feel like you're making something super contemporary unless it, I mean the craft legacy was a bit different because Zoe Lister Jones the director wanted the kids to feel cool and trendy and kind of what was going on now but for me usually that's something I actually kind of stay away from because I want the project that I designed to have longevity and to have sort of um something classic about it having said that i think a lot of you know more old hollywood movies like my fair lady which is also another favorite of mine um they the fabrics they used in that were not um necessarily period accurate for the time but it told the story in a really interesting way and i think you know sometimes people get really um really wound up over whether fabric is period accurate or not for mm. what you're designing. And I think under within context, it's really important if you're designing something that's supposed to feel like you're within that era, then you should. But if you look at, you know, something like Bridgerton, which is kind of fantasy and fantastical, it's a lot like My Fair Lady in that regard of it's, it's more about the feeling versus the reality. So that's well, kind of a long-winded answer. To her. No, it's a great answer. You know, I thought Ready or Not uh, had beautiful costume design. And in a way, you it was interesting because you're dealing with a, a storied, moneyed family that has a mysterious past. And yet it felt classical. It felt like it was what time period did this movie take place in? It could have been almost any time. And I think that the it was quite a beautiful looking movie. And when you approach something like that, were you given a lot like I guess how when you when you a lot of costume designers say everything begins with the script. Is that yeah. true for you? Yeah, one hundred percent. It's my blueprint. It's and I I love getting inspiration from words and not images. I think it's such mm. a interesting approach like the project i just finished was based on two books and i got all of my information from the page um wow. but yeah with ready or not um i really wanted it to feel hyper psychological because of what grace is enduring and for me the best i mean i already approach things from a timeless standpoint but for mm -hmm. me the best way of approaching that was to make everyone sort of feel like you didn't necessarily know what period or where you were. No, and I think that really came out. Now, when you're with that kind of a philosophy, do you have to work with 
the director of photography and the production designer to sort of make sure that the lighting design of the film and obviously the, the, the location was fantastic and then the sets. Um, how, how closely do you work with those other keys? I mean, it always depends on the project and how collaborative other people are. I'm the type of person that likes to talk about everything and like, every, you know, down to the button. And some people just don't care or, um, you know, just want to be insular. But I think it's really important that the the cinematographer, the production designer and the costume designer are all aligned or it 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 looks like a fragmented movie, in my opinion. You can always tell when you're watching something um and you can tell if there was a disconnect there but um on ready or not i've worked actually with andrew stern the production designer twice now we did eight bit together again um and we worked very well together and then brett who was the cinematographer i did um a lot of color testing with him mm -hmm. because and um and even with the the fabric of the white dress because white generally glows on the screen so you have to tech it and um you know we deliberately picked lace tyler one of the directors really wanted lace um because it shows blood so well um, <laughs> and i picked tool because it would um you know unravel and fall apart and you, you would get the more textural the better uh when it comes to blood so those were all deliberate, but I worked very closely with Brett. And, you know, something I actually learned when I worked on Hannibal was when you're working with lighting, generally genre lighting, um, it's always a little bit darker or puttier or like a bit more, there's like a sepia tone to it. And so colors in a store that you would normally stray from because they're so, you know, kind of like jarring and poppy actually look really beautiful and saturated. So... I took that approach with the um, the purple robes that you see. They're actually in real life, like a horrible, horrible, like Barney color. Um, <laughs> but we tested those several times because I wanted them to feel rich and saturated. Um, so yes, work very closely with other department heads. Well, that wedding dress was, was pretty iconic and it had to go through, I'm always curious. I mean, that dress had to go through hell and it yeah. had to be both cinematic and beautiful but it also had to endure <laughs> crawling around and <laughs> being involved in in committing acts of violence or defensive when you when you had to make that wedding dress how did you begin like did you take into consideration obviously the way it was going to look too but it had to be very utilitarian and where do you begin designing something like that was it built up from from scratch and and uh, how many did you make so there were 24 dresses total, seven for her stunt and 17 for Samara. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, so it needs that. a budget on, on a line item budget unto itself. Oh, I did because they didn't believe me. And so I, they did not <laughs> believe me. I needed 24 dresses and um, I love a good spreadsheet. So I uh, created a grace dress document. I have it somewhere and it's, line item by line item in the script every little thing that happens to her because you know you shoot these things out of order the continuity in ready or not you particularly also because it it's one script day um we had to be meticulous and so i wanted to track everything in a very sort of hardcore manner so right. um I had my spreadsheet and I, from the get go, I was like, the more fabric we give her, the more she has to work with and the more the directors have to take away by the end of the film. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I, um, to me, at least for Grace, from her perspective, it was almost as if she was marrying into a royal family. So I based the dress off of Kate Middleton and Grace Kelly. They <laughs> wore very similar dresses that were lace and had a tool skirt. Um, so that was sort of the inspiration. And then I actually built the dress in five parts because the movie had no money. We were filming on location. Samara is a total trooper, but we were changing her in a tent out of her multiples all the time. So 
it's actually a corset, a lace top, a sash, which she uses in the movie, not to spoil anything. Um, and then two skirts. So then if, you know, we needed a new multiple of the top, but didn't have to change the bottom, it made changing easier and more efficient for the directors. So I kind of, I thought of it from sort of a very utilitarian standpoint from the get go. Did you, I'm curious about when you have a, a uh, did you guys shoot in continuity, like in order? No. Because Me. I would say that would double, I mean, so for people that don't know, you know, movies a lot of the time are not shot in order of production. And when you have a piece of clothing that is, it gets more and more ravaged as the movie goes along, did that pose difficulty for you to figure out like, okay, where are we in the script? I mean, it, it was challenging, but what I actually did was like, I literally drew a blueprint of Grace and laminated it. And I had a meeting up like with her dress and I had a meeting with the directors um, and their producer, Chad. And we sat down and I went through my my super boring line, uh, line item spreadsheet. And I was like, okay, so at this point, when she gets stabbed here, where do you want that on her body? And then we draw it on. So that, because we shot wow. on the first day. Yeah. On the first day we shot um, the end of the movie when she's covered in blood. And so it had to have every single little detail of what happens to her figured out we shot the wedding and the end so yeah so i i, I created this laminated blueprint and that's what we worked off of wow it's this kind of detail the script supervisor must have loved you <laughs> it's like where are we <laughs> no, i'm like i'm neurotic when it comes to continuity and details and all that stuff you have well, to be for it well, to be yeah, believed I mean when it's all put together. I, I, it's, well, it's that you want people in every, you know, every aspect of production to be that detail minded. And on something like ready or not, I would imagine, uh, y you were probably a joy for the rest of the production, <laughs> keeping track of all this. Boy or annoying. I'm not sure. But. I don't know. I, you know what, I, as a, as a director, I would have to imagine that, that that was very much appreciated. Um, <laughs> by 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 that staff i mean everybody working at that level would be i mean that's the kind of detail you need to make sure that a production and i think that's actually that film had that you said it had no money but it shows what planning and um and 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 forethought can bring you a, into a production like that because it certainly doesn't betray its budget it's a very lush looking movie well i have to say too like um Matt Tyler and Chad from Radio Silence are they're three of my most favorite people to work with. They're hyper collaborative. I actually just had dinner with them when I was in um, Los Angeles and they they just you know you often will have meetings and people will kind of get their back up against the wall if you suggest something that's not exactly what they wanted or what they had in mind, but they are so open-minded and just down to make the best product possible. Sure. I think when you have someone who's that collaborative and you have very little money, you're able to riff off of each other and then plan things to the nth degree. Um, and that was my experience with them. You know, it was, okay, we can't, necessarily afford to do this but what if we approach it in this way and you know with grace's dress i can give you these part mo moving parts so you can move faster on set and stuff like that so um yeah they're amazing and i would work with them 100 times you you had a great quote about this dress you you said that marriage is such a traditional patriarchal institution and she just completely disassembles that and reappropriates that symbol as a tool for her, which I love as a concept. I mean, I love that you put in basically a literary idea into costume design. And it makes sense talking to you saying that everything comes first to you from from words. You know, yeah. you don't I, I just love that idea that there's an actual literary concept behind your design work i mean that's not something that you the idea that 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 a wedding dress represents the patriarchy and flipping that on on its head i i love that idea 
was that something that that you shared with the production team because i just or your the, the pe- people that you're working with designing because i i just love that idea that it was that th- those that you know it's like the great the great works of literature and the great works of philosophy i love the idea that you're injecting philosophy into your design Thanks. i mean like literary not just like yeah not not like costume design philosophy but actual you know yeah. real i i love that i mean i i've never heard anyone say that before and i think it's fantastic yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's interesting. I, I think it actually comes back to weirdly high school. I went to a high school where I took conceptual art classes. It was mm. like a very advanced high school and for, for the arts. And so I approach everything from a hyper conceptual point of view. And I think that's where that comes from. And everything has symbolism to me. Everything that I do um, has meaning. And, uh, you know, sometimes it is how it's going to photograph and what's going to look most sure. beautiful. Um, yeah. I, and I, there's also a point in the script where um, she's confronted Alex and uh, we called it the goat dress because she falls into the, goat carcass area and what i actually did was we dyed the dresses a shade darker of gray um to be gray and that's the the turning point of like this is not a wedding dress to her anymore right and i wanted a very deliberate shift in color even though it's the same dress and actually uh finally marilyn vance who uh co-created this podcast yes and Die Hard, Die Hard, the tank top in Die Hard was a huge inspiration for me. Really? Uh, that Bruce She'll Wilson. love to hear that. Yeah. Um, because it go and when I first learned breakdown, actually the, the breakdown artist, Ager Dyer, who did Grace's Dresses, Alex Kavanaugh, who also uh, was and still is a mentor of mine. We had this full circle moment because she taught me how to do breakdown. She taught me so many things and when i got ready or not i was like i need the best of the best for this because it's so important to the movie and when i got the job searchlight said to me this dress is a character in itself so for me i was like cool no pressure um <laughs> but i enlisted alex and when i learned breakdown alex um used the tank top in die hard as an example of like a master class in breakdown so wow. it was a very full circle kind of moment. Could you could you sort of explain, give us a background what you mean by that? Um in terms of breakdown. Like, like on Grace's dress or Yeah, but like in just in general, the whole like like how the John McClain because I think this is really important. I think we don't yeah. we don't normally touch on these kinds of things. Yeah, people don't really realize in projects if you see so okay, first of all, in um in genre or horror, generally speaking, you have something called multiples. And a multiple is, so in Ready or Not, Samara Weaving, who plays Grace, she has 17 multiples of her dress. And that is because several different things happen to her in the dress, but also she performs stunts in the dress. So you need iteration, sub-iterations of each dress. So Within the 17, I had subcategories. But then when you see something happen to someone in a movie, um, for instance, if they fall to the ground, you will get some breakdown, some dirt or grime on it. Um, If someone has had a garment for 15 years, it wouldn't look like you got it at H&M off the rack. It would look, it would go through a process. We would probably over diet um when you see clothing on camera that's white we generally speaking do something called a tech which is to make it slightly cream or slightly gray depending on what the cinematographer likes um so breakdown is generally giving a treatment to clothing items or accessories that makes it look aged dyed or to connect all of the sort of continuity dots is how i would kind of and it's, I mean, what I love about that is it's not, you know, when you're making a movie, 
like you said, we talked earlier about shooting out of continuity. If there's blood splatters and you're going back and forth between one one part of the movie and another, and it's not being shot in continuity, uh, then you have to, or not being shot in order, you have to make sure the continuity stays the same. Like the blood splatters, like you said, you're very detail oriented. You're going to make sure that the stab wounds or the blood patterns are going to stay the same throughout the movie because otherwise it betrays the illusion of what's going on. Well, it's a huge disservice to the work everyone's doing. And also it, um, it's very distracting when to <laughs> it, people notice. Yes, they do. You're speaking. Uh, so yeah, no, we were, we were lucky that ready or not everything. Well, another show, I mean, and again, I love that. I love that film. Um, uh, it's funny. The first time I ever saw Ready or Not, I was on an airplane and I watched it twice back to back. Yeah. Amazing. Because <laughs> I, I, I loved it so much. And then, of course, I went out and bought it. But one of the things that you've recently worked on is Sex Life, the TV yeah. series. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of great costume design work uh, in that series. And, oh, uh, you know, there's a. There's, there's the costume design of that show. It's sort of critical. It, it, it kind of has to be emotional, spicy, sensual, kind of all at once. And um, what was your approach to that? And, and what was the nature of the when you came on board that show? Were you given any mandates at all, or did you do what you always do and go to the script first and let the words guide you? Well, I was very um, collaborative with Stacy, the showrunner. Um, but I really approached it from, uh, and the reason, so I'll go back a bit. The reason <laughs> I took on the job was I really liked this notion of this woman who's kind of trying to connect all of the parts of herself. And I think something that I really work hard to do when I create characters is we often see very one dimensional women in media who, um, you know, only wear one certain type of thing and don't, don't really have any character or interest or layers to sort of who they are. And this project was such an identity crisis of the lead. And I thought it was really important to show that and to show that women go through many different phases and live many different lives within this one lifetime. And so we got to explore that with Sarah and I sort of, I also explored the idea of her past as a memory so that I, the entire palette was very saturated um, and kind of glittery. And then her modern day life, I didn't want it to feel depressing um, even though she's sort of mentally struggling. So we, and also it's in Connecticut. So we went more kind of pastel and Ralph Lauren and um, yeah, I wanted it to feel a bit polarizing for her too. Hmm. Um, so it's all about the psychology for me of what's going on in their mind. But yeah, for for that project, it was very collaborative with Stacey and we were both on the same page. And um, but yeah, color was, color is where I start with everything really. I tell, I, you can tell a lot with color in my opinion. And it might just be that I, because I come from a family of artists, it's so. Sure. Well, ask, asking you about that, a lot of costume designers I've spoken to have talked about how much art matters to their aesthetic. I mean, I'm talking about the great, I don't know, Renaissance painters or, or the, the, and because that you come from a family of artists, do you spend a lot of time in museums looking at paintings for ideas about light and fabric and tone, things like that? I did. Um, I haven't <laughs> since the pandemic very much. But sure. Yeah, I, I grew up in museums. Like whenever I traveled, it the sightseeing aspect was museums for us. And um, in Toronto, there's the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I, I mean, I went there like once a month as a kid. It's just sort of innate with me. And, you know, John Singer Sargent, I'd say, is probably one of my favorite painters and mm. someone that I look to a lot because of his use of light. And um, I actually, he was a reference for Ready or Not for me. Wow. Yeah. Well, I would be remiss when it comes to sex life if I didn't ask about Billy Mann's metallic pink 
Oh, ja- yes. The, the metallic pink mono jacket <laughs> that has a life of its own. Where did that come from? What's the history? Tell us the whole, tell us the whole story. That was scripted. Um, a metallic pink leather jacket. And we camera tested several swatches. I got the leather in New York. Um, and I actually... I was like a pretty hardcore party girl when I was younger, when, when I lived in New York. And it was a, it was kind of for me a love letter to when I lived in New York and, you know, had no responsibility. Um, <laughs> and I actually loosely based it on a leather jacket that I had at that time. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, there's a fashion designer here in Toronto called, um, or her name is Izzy Kimlary, and she... She has a lot of building here for a lot of production, um, and she made it. Wow. So, now, how long those... did you sketch that out? Did you, uh, you said it was yeah. already based on your design, so you already had a, or your, your own, you knew what it kind of looked like, but how long did it take you to come up with that jacket? Like, did uh, you no, do no. a bunch <laughs> of sketches? I did, I think, three options wow. for Stacey and drew them and, um, gave her swatches and had kind of examples of kind of the cut and Sarah Shaw, he, the lead, um, she really wanted it. And I, I felt the same. We wanted it to feel because she buys it in a vintage store. So we didn't want it to fit perfectly. So mm. we want to feel a bit boxy and oversized, um, which took some convincing with, Um, I think others, because it, it just, you know, everyone wants the actress to look as kind of prim and proper and great. Um, Stacy was on board, but it, you know, it, it goes through several people sometimes, uh, costumes. Um, but yeah, it, I, it took me like a day to design it. It was kind of a no brainer for me because I like leather motorcycle jack, like I had, so many of them kind of when I was younger that it was just like it was it was not a hard task for me whatsoever and Stacy had references of what she wanted so it was pretty straightforward sad to say there's not some fantastical story behind it no but I mean it's it's funny that something like that can become relatively iconic you know and and uh you, you never know I mean sometimes you think well it must have taken further well no oh, yeah <laughs> well, it's funny because when I, I signed on to Ready or Not, I didn't think that um, I didn't think anything of the project. I just thought it was a funny script that was a bit campy and it was either going to be really great or really horrible. But I just I find whenever I um, sign on to a project and my goal is to just enjoy the process and not really care too much about the end product is when I get the best results. Um, which is really hard in our field because everyone is so result driven. Yeah. It, because the, the thing about film is you never know how something is going to turn out. You can think that it's going to be a blockbuster hit. You can have the right director, you can have all the right actors and it can just turn out horribly. And so the, the thing that I've sort of gotten to, which has taken a while is the process is the most important part Mm -hmm. of making the movie. Because well, everyone thinks the movie they're the show they're going to work on is going to win Emmys and Academy Awards. Yeah, you know that's what you go into everything thinking that. Yeah, I think that's a good mindset to have, though. Like you said, though, the the process is key, and the yeah. people that enjoy the process usually bring us the best results. Well, because you you're present when you're doing it versus you know being focused on other things that are less important. Well, another another horror, um, uh, the craft legacy. You know, I think the craft is the first, the original craft is this iconic film that when you, you know, it's one of those great movies that everybody saw. Yeah. You know, and when you got to work on, on, on bringing that back, uh, how did you approach that show? First of all, how did you get that, that job and were you excited about it? I mean, come on, designing clothes for witches. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny. I didn't think I was going to get the job <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I, so I know Ashley, who was um, the production manager on it, she did Ready or Not. And she reached out to me and she's like, Zoe wants to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And I had heard that someone else was interviewing for it. And it sounded like that was the case. And I didn't, I just like, was like, don't waste my time. It was one of those, 
I had had a year where I think I'd had three projects go down and six interviews and didn't get any of them. And I was just in a place of like, I can't, my heart can't break anymore. Um, and so with Ashley, I was like, Are, do you actually want to interview me? Or is this part of your, like, is there some corporate process here? Where you, <laughs> like, just be honest. Because if you need to, if you need to email three people, say you, or not email, if you need to interview three people, just say you interviewed me. I don't care. Use my name. What? And she was like, no, they actually want to meet you. And I was like, okay. And I still in my head was like, this is a trick. Like, this isn't real. So I... Um, I went to, uh, meet Zoe and Italia, her producing partner, and I did mood boards. Um, and I just did, because I didn't think I was going to get the job. I just did what I, like what I would do if, if without thinking about what anyone else would think. And that's always when you get the job, in my opinion. Right. Um, well, cause it's unfettered creativity. You're not second guessing. You're. Here I, so I went to the meeting and I, I, you know, I thought they were really cool. And, um, I brought my book and I also brought, um, I have this really great book called untypical girls by Sam McNee. He's, um, a punk historian from the UK Wow, he has these great books that, um, show how people in, um, the India punk scene dress and untypical girls is women from like, I think the sixties to the eighties in the transatlantic um, indie scene. And when I went, I was like, or when I, I met with them, I, the thing that I was really struggling with, with designing the sequel or doing the craft today is a lot of people dress like the girls in the original um, who are popular girls. Like the way they dress in the original is very, trendy now and so you can't you also can't redo something so iconic right press them all the same it's just so my my pitch was the greatest act of rebellion as a young girl is to actually be an individual hmm. and to look different from everyone else and have your own really distinct style um which i would agree with like i I remember, you know, being in high school and I always dressed differently, but I was always so focused on what other people thought of how I looked. And I, so I, I thought that that would be sort of the most empowering approach to updating these girls. And then again, on the page on, I think it was page two, you see the girls and they're, um, three of them, Tabby, Lourdes and Frankie are, um, performing a ritual and they're fire, earth, and air, and they're missing their water. And when I read that, I was like, that's, that's the blueprint. We're going to do these girls based on their elements. So I designed each girl based on their element. So that was the color palette. Yeah reference. And then, you know, you see Lily, who is um Nancy Downs's daughter you find out um so I I I made some references to the original like she wears chokers like Nancy did but they're pearls because her element is water and then she wears lots of tie-dye and blue and um Frankie whose air I actually her palette was like a rainbow <laughs> so just super colorful um, Lourdes was sort of our nod to the original, but, um, so she did have like the patent leather and plaid and whatnot, but her element was earth. Um, and then I, I went to, there's a crystal store here that I grew up going to. Um, and I went with a production designer and we picked crystals for each character that were sort of, um, put throughout the production design and in the costume design. So like Lourdes has a pair of pants that I, so you never see them in the movie, which like kills me because they're so beautiful, but <laughs> she has um, crystals sewn, like they're like pendant crystals and they're sewn all down the front of her pants. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my approach. And you know, it, it's tricky because 
witchcraft and sort of the esoteric arts are so normalized now and it was such a like crazy concept still in the 90s but you know you um you listen to podcasts like it's kind of part of the zeitgeist and so normalized so it was a really tricky thing to approach and i also knew that no matter what i did the diehard fans would just not like the fact that it was um being reboot sure so i just let that go and i was like you know what i you're never going to make everyone happy as a designer and you know the original was important to me and it was one of the most beautiful filmmaking experiences i've ever had it was such a um I've always felt like a total misfit and it's one of the first places that I actually felt really like I was like with my people. Um, hmm. Yeah. Well, I got to ask you before we get into 8-Bit Christmas, I got to ask you about JT Leroy because yeah. an old girlfriend of mine was friends with Laura Albert and okay. I hung out with her. <laughs> it's just, and uh, it was quite an interesting experience. And I'm, you know, for those of you, I, we don't have to tell the whole story of JT Leroy and, and, and all of that. But it, to me, it's one of the great, I don't know, call it unique pop culture stories of the last 25 years. I mean, it's a really fascinating tale that plays into our modern age and social media and manipulation and all kinds of things. Yeah. What was it like for you? I would imagine with your background you must have had a particular insight into this project and was it something that you went after how did you how did you find yourself on the movie no it was, it was uh so justin kelly the director was having a hard time finding a a designer that kind of i guess got it and uh his producer patrick reached out to my agent and was like do you have any suggestions were having a hard time. And um, so it was a Thursday. I jumped on a Zoom call with him. I didn't do any mood boards, anything. Wow. And I was like, this is how I would approach it. Like, I think, you know, I knew a little bit about the story, but not a whole lot. Um, and I pitched him and then Monday I was on a plane. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. yeah. Because, again, there's a lot of really interesting design work in there. And, of course, you had the real people to base it off of. But you, you didn't – I guess you didn't – in that particular story, you didn't really have to make it – did you have to make it closer to reality or could you – did you have a little bit more freedom? Uh, well, it was interesting because Savannah Noop, who um, was the physical manifestation of JT, yeah. co the script and was there. Okay. So I had full consultation with them the whole time, and they actually um, were in a lot of Kristen Stewart's fittings with me. So it was very meta. <laughs> I can. I was just like, wow. <laughs> that person be like, I wouldn't wear that, or I would wear that, or why don't you put it with this and that? And at first, I was a little like, oh, just let me do my job. Like, <laughs> I actually really like. It was really interesting because Savannah. I've never seen anyone wear clothes like Savannah. Like it's fascinating. Mm. Um, it was really interesting. Um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting project for sure, and it was really fun and wild and um, kind of the best worst clothing in terms of like early two thousand fashion. <laughs> <laughs> of our finest fashion uh moments but i kind of just leaned into that and it was it was fun to look at you know savannah loves clothes um but they approach it in such a sort of primitive way i guess is a good way of describing it and so it was really it felt like every day was unlearning the status quo on how you're supposed to get dressed and you know you as a costume designer, you spend your life sort of trying to learn the principles and, you know, how the corset is laced properly. And right. Is the fact, and, you know, Savannah just comes in and it's like, nope, flip the table. <laughs> and it, it was, it was, it was cool. Well, it, it, again, I thought a, a, a film that I was particularly interested in seeing and I thought you did a great job. So oh, thank, it's, you. thank you. Well, that sort of brings us to 8-Bit Christmas, which just dropped. Um, yeah. 
you know, I, I it's so funny. It, it feels like every year now with streaming services from the Hallmark Channel to Netflix to Amazon, everyone, we have a deluge of Christmas movies. <laughs> you know, and I don't. A lot of them are rom coms and everything, but I saw the trailer for Eight Bit Christmas and I'm like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm down with this. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it has elements in a way of kind of like the Princess Bride and obviously a Christmas story and '80s nostalgia, uh, we, which we had brought back in full force with something like Stranger Things. Um, and I have to say, I really loved Eight Bit Christmas. I, I thought it was a, a lot of fun. I mean, I really, how can you not? It's <laughs> right up my alley. Yes, I yeah. instead of a Red Rider BB gun, we want a Nintendo Entertainment System. I'm like, I relate. Yeah. I relate to this. Well, the reason I actually, um, so how I got the job was Jonathan Sadowski, who is in Sex Life, who plays Devin, is also a producer. Um, and he had been doing 8-Bit while we were doing Sex Life before it went down, and 8-Bit went down as well. And then when we wrapped Sex Life, 8-Bit came back. And they lost their original designer, mm. um, had previously worked with Mike Douse, the director. And Jonathan randomly FaceTimed me. <laughs> I was like, hello. <laughs> um, right. and, and he was like, do you want to like do this movie? Like, you obviously have to interview. And, and I was like, I had just finished Sex Life. And I was like, sure. Why not? Like, uh, I'm always like, this is the, I just finished a project and this is the first time in my career where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing next. And I'm totally cool with that. I usually like in the last month, I'm like, what's the next job? What, like, where am I? Anyways, I'm, I've worked for a year and a half straight through COVID. So I'm, I'm very happy to not work for a hot minute. Yeah. But, um, anyways, so I met with Mike and I, I read the script and then I read the book and I wasn't allowed to play Nintendo when I was a kid. I have no hand-eye coordination when it comes to working. Uh, I don't even know what it's called, like the controls. That's how. That's how. Like, it was like I was in like an artist cult growing up. Like playing Nintendo was still. My mom still thinks it's like the devil. Um, <laughs> anyway, so my great act of rebellion was designing Eight Bit Christmas. <laughs> Because I was living vicariously <laughs> through the kids of being denied Nintendo. Yeah. I well, I it, it, look. I think the eighties. This there's a lot of things. Like I remember things like when I was a kid. Well, not a kid, but in high school, like the preppy handbook had come out, explaining yeah. all about that kind of style and what people were supposed yeah. to wear, and very much an East Coast. And I'm from Seattle, you know, right. and we we didn't really. We didn't have people. I, I mean, I wore like argyle sweaters and button-down polo shirts and things like that. But I never thought of it as a style. It was just more utilitarian. It's cold. See, <laughs> layer up. But but like you know, this is set in in, in Chicago and and um uh uh. How did you approach? You had both eighties nostalgia, and then you have all the different kinds of period costumes. And you know, again, you had a book. I don't know. Does is the book set in exactly the same time as the movie? Yeah, it is. Okay. So Kevin Jabowski, I think that's how you yeah. say it. If I've ruined that, Kevin, I'm sorry. Um, he wrote the book and he wrote the script, and it's based on his life. Um, so like some of the people in the book are real people. Oh. A lot. Like it's very much a love letter to his childhood. Um, and so. I, a lot of the ideas were already on the page. A lot of, um, the, like the spree boots, um, a lot, like a lot of that stuff was kind of already there. And then Mike Douse, the director, who's a kid of the eighties had such a clear, like very almost stubborn idea of what certain things should be and look like. And something that you know i really wanted the project to feel like and when i signed on and what was very important to mike was you know it, we didn't want it to feel like schlocky 80s right um, and you know the 80s got a really bad reputation but there was actually some really great elements to the 80s like prep um style with so we really tried to lean into that and i you know i i got kind of a list of movies to watch for it um terms of endearment 
being one of them with Christy Zia, who designed the costumes, she yeah. did the production design for that. Um, and then, of course, Marilyn Vance. We come back to Miss Marilyn. Um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Pre and Pink, Breakfast Club. Like, all I, of the Hughes. I mean, the most iconic, you know, John Hughes, the most iconic 80s, 80s films. Um, and so, you know, it was it was leaning into the the classic side of the 80s, which there's a lot of and people don't realize they think it's like big shoulder pads, but the big shoulder pads were actually more late 80s, early 90s. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a there's a perspective of what 80s is. And we really tried to lean into the the classical element of it. And we wanted to create like what felt like a really classic 80s movie. Oh, also planes, trains and automobiles. That was another one. A good Chicago yeah. movie. Yeah, you know another another John Hughes film. Yep. So yeah, I, I, I that's uh so when you when you're doing that, I mean obviously you you had COVID to deal with, and you're you're there's a lot of wardrobe in the film. Also, I, I'm curious about the color, the aspects of color. It's a pretty colorful. That was movie. very important to Mike, um, and also for me, like I think when you. And for kids, it's a kids movie, right? And kids love color and they're attracted to it. And we wanted it to feel fun and fantastical and poppy and um, exciting. And, you know, you don't get that with kind of subdued, pretty neutrals. Right. Like right. it's um, it's a pop cultural kind of uh, like it's pop culture. So when when you get pop culture, generally there's color involved and i wanted to have each kid feel very individual in terms of their style to um that's how they were scripted you know the group of friends are kind of all a bit odd and different <laughs> um and so we wanted them to feel very distinct and when i it was i had to build a lot um when you do a project with kids, you generally want a minimum of three items per kid. So, you know, if someone's wearing a polo shirt you for a kid, you want a multiple in case they spill on themselves. Mm -hmm. they will. A multiple for a photo devil. And then a hero. So we made almost everything. And so I illustrated sort of the hero costumes in terms of like what the boot, the hat, the accessories, the jacket hero items would be. And I did a full lineup for Mike of all the kids together. And then we sent it to HBO. Um, and then we did the camera test. And that's sort of how I picked the colors was based on how all the kids would look kind of together in a lineup. Well, the so when you, when you, I did a little bit of work for HBO on a TV show and they do have notes. <laughs> you know, there are things they get back. What did you get back from them in terms of like your design work? And, and was that something new for you having to get network, a network approval as opposed to just working with the director? No. Um, you know, I worked in TV for a while when I first started. So mm. I was used to notes on like, like this person doesn't like lace and it's like okay you don't like lace but society might <laughs> right. like you you get these people who don't like certain things and it it's just their personal preference but um i actually found them pretty easy to work with there were just certain things like uh you know i don't like these boots or stuff like that that we had to tweak but it was challenging in covid because toronto was in a total lockdown right. so no stores were open um, yeah how did you manage that how did you you know with everything locked down how are you able to and and there's not an insubstantial amount of clothes in this movie there's a lot going on yeah i don't honestly i don't know <laughs> it was so hard it was a very hard movie to make but you know we leaned heavily on rental houses um at the beginning, I ordered a ton of fabric. Like I just, I said to production, I was like, uh, I don't know what else to do, but to have fabric as like a weapon against this situation. And then we'll, just, <laughs> we'll like, we'll make things when, I don't know. Yeah, it was, 
we made as much as we could because we knew we'd have control over that. It was sort of what can we control and manage and that, but you know, um, there's a gentleman in Toronto named Martino who everyone in the city used forever. And in the middle of our prep, he passed away from COVID and he was making uh. a ton of our stuff. So it was just like, it felt like anything that could go wrong kind of did go wrong. But, um, and then we ordered a ton online. Any, like, you know, there are a lot of companies that still make stuff that look like it's from the 80s or have the same cut of pants, like a good Levi's 501. Always reliable. Right. Uh, LL Bean, they have not changed a lot. Land's End. So we just, we ordered essentially like a mall, which is probably <laughs> not very eco friendly, but it was survival. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you have to do what you have to do. I mean, those yeah. clothes are existing somewhere. <laughs> why not? Why not put them to good use? Yeah, exactly. Um, and we donated a ton at the end to a bunch of charities. Oh, that's great. Better, so yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff went to Warner, and then everything else went to charity. So that made me feel a little less destructive. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, that I think uh, 8-Bit Christmas is going to be another one of those perennial holiday favorites, and it'll be streaming forever, I guess, on HBO Max. So it'll be something I think everybody's going to enjoy. I thought the conceit of it was brilliant. Which one? Well, it, that 8-Bit Christmas, you know, the conceit of the movie, wanting okay. a game system, I think we all can relate to that. I mean, you know, when I was a kid of the 80s, it was like, yeah, I wanted it in television. Then I wanted a ColecoVision. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then, of course, the Nintendo system came out, and everybody wanted one of those. And then it was an N64, and then it was a PlayStation and a PlayStation 2. So it's, I think everybody, it's a multi-generational, the, the hook is multi-generational, and people watch that forever. Well, even just the, like, the aspect of the desperation for a gift as a child. Yeah. Nintendo or not, like I think kids even who are growing up today who are like three, if they watch it in 10 years, they'll relate to it. Like it, it just there's there's just an underlying part to it that really captures what it's like to be a, a kid wanting something and going to extreme measures for it. So, yeah. You know, I, I'm curious about, you know, like you said about the 80s there. There's always the 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 puffy um, shoulder pads and all that. That's, but when I think about the '80s, to me, I think about the whole because that was probably the most in my life the most formative decade. But there were so many different, like to me, the mid '80s. I think about Miami Vice and linen suits and peach T-shirts and and Genera loafers with no socks, you know, and those pants. But then in the early '80s. I think much more New York punk kind of like the Ramones or, or early, more early punk rock or, or in terms of Los Angeles, I think of movies like Valley Girl where you had the Hollywood punks versus the Sherman Oaks Galleria crowd or, or Fast Times at Ridgemont High. But then, like you said, as you moved into the late eighties, there's kind of this huge, there's a, just a wide variety of different kinds of fashion throughout the 80s. It seems like that other decades didn't have nearly as much fashion. I don't remember fashion changing as much as it did in the 80s. Maybe that's just me looking back. But when it comes to 80s style, do you have favorite, like you mentioned Marilyn Vance's work on, on John Hughes movies, but do you have other touchstones? Like I, I said to Marilyn, I go, you know, Euro trash terrorists never looked as good as they looked in Die Hard. I mean, you defined that yeah. whole the what 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 we when I hear Euro trash and some dude in a club or something. I'm thinking about the way she dressed those terrorists, and they were multinational. I mean, they, some of them had long Fabio hair, some of them had short hair. I mean, it was that's the greatest array of characters ever in that movie. But do you have favorite elements of 80s fashion that you'd maybe like to see brought back or? Maybe do the ultimate '80s throwback movie. Oh, wow, that's a really good question. You know, I'm a real sucker for prep. Like, I it, it has never gone out of style either, which I think is right. such a testament to how like polo shirts were still wearing them. Are got like I have loved penny loafers since I was a kid. Weirdly, I've always been obsessed with them. Um, so I don't know that it it the thing too is that. The 80s, in my opinion, has never 
really gone out of style. It just gets reappropriated in different ways. Like right, right. now, huge trend with girls and kind of the baggy shoulder pads, which to me is more early 90s, um, the stuff you're seeing right now. But uh, I don't know. I mean, and I also have like an affinity for punk as well, because that's, I mean, I, Betsy Johnson was like my first mentor, right? And she was kind of a huge part of that. Um, yeah. And just my parents kind of were in that world. So um, I'd, but also like, I would have, I would say within that, you know, punk on camera is really hard. It is very rare in my opinion that I see in movies where punk is defined properly and accurately. I would agree with you. What, what would you say is an example of a, of a, of a, a authentic depiction of punk? Oh, I forget the movie. Um, who's the director? He did. What's her name from Aaliyah Shawkat from Arrested Development is in it. It's mm. hold on. Because I think back to movies like Repo Man or Liquid Sky or or um, Ladies and Gentlemen, the Fabulous Stains, and there's there's it's hard, it's more indie stuff, yeah, Suburbia, it, Penelope Spheris. I mean, that's the thing. I think generally speaking, it's it has to be indie stuff because, again, it's like the level of breakdown that. Um, It's it's just such a tricky, tricky. People too, but punk is so easy to go overboard on. Yeah, that's you know, and, and that's what I always hate is when you see depictions of it. It's like that's not authentic. It's too much. Oh, you know what it is? Green Room. It's a. It's by... oh, I loved. It's yeah. Jeremy Saulnier. Yeah, directed that movie. Yes. Uh, that movie is incredible. As a yeah. matter of fact, Jeremy Saulnier's, if you watch Blue Ruin and Green Room, those two films, I mean, like, I love that you said Green Room. That movie does not get enough love. That movie's incredible. With yeah. the great Anton Yelchin, rest in peace. Yeah. Well, um, and it, the costumes, I think, are, I don't know off the top of my head, the designer, but I think they did such a great job. And that's an example of a movie where they probably had limited money. And so the clothing probably came from thrift stores. And, right. you know, people in who are in the punk scene who I kind of grew up around, but was never, I, I grew up around a lot of musicians. And so I, I would go to shows and stuff like that, but I never really defined myself as that, but um, they generally shop at thrift stores. They don't have a lot of money. So it, it, it becomes a thing when you are on bigger budget shows and you're kind of, you, sometimes you need multiples and the breakdown isn't as, as raw or as you know necessarily great as it could be if you did more of an independent project but yeah mm. green i think is an excellent contemporary example of punk costume design. i agree and it's a what a punk movie that is just in general it's just like a good piece of film well i mean this has been delightful i uh, uh i'm i was a fan of yours before but now meeting you and talking to you i'm, I'm much more of a fan of yours even now um yeah I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. But if you have any advice, I mean, I love the fact that you came from a family of artists and that you actually went out of your way to make sure that you had the kind of training and learning how to make clothes and, and coming from a design background. But is there anything you can offer in terms of advice to people that want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, I think um, it's actually a piece of advice that was given to me on one of my first days on set, and it was be a sponge. And I think um, I have always loved costume at my core and I've always wanted to sort of take in as much information as that would be offered to me. And I think, um, and also being humble about um, knowing things. Like I've always approached my work as if I'm not the smartest person in the room. And I find sometimes with people who are just starting out they're so eager to prove that they deserve to be there that they kind of get lost um in knowing everything and i think you know i approach everything as if i know i don't know enough because mm. i just have a thirst for knowledge and i think the minute you feel like you know a lot 
is the minute you probably shouldn't be working in film because the, you know, the thing I love about this job is I'm such a student of life. And so I, every project I learned so much about a, a subject matter that I knew nothing about or a new technique or, um, so I think just be open-minded and open to learning and, you know, put your ego aside because you, if you want to be a head of department, you can't have an ego. You can, but it'll be a hard, hard, hard road for you. Right. Now, I know that you've got Painkiller uh, coming up, uh, which is about the opioid crisis, from what I understand, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting that there's a multiple projects about that that very subject, which I, I love because it's a fascinating and it's ongoing. So it's... It's, yeah. it's uh, one of the more heavy projects I've worked on. It was, you know, a lot, but um, it's I'm really excited uh, the costume. I wish I could talk about it. The costumes, because there's some really uh, hilarious, interesting things I've done uh, <laughs> in that costume. Um, so it, yeah, I'm very excited for it to come out. It spans over many periods. Mm -hmm. of my work, so I did a lot of um, period costuming, which was cool, and over 700 costumes in wow. the series. So. Wow, that's huge. Yeah. It, in hindsight, there probably should have been two costume designers, but uh, that's why I'm taking time off now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, are you active on social media? Can people follow you on, say, Instagram and see your work? Yep. Uh, my handle is just my name, Avery Pluis, on all social media. Well, Avery Pluis, this was a delightful conversation. I want to thank you for your time, your expertise. Uh, what a delight you were to speak with. And, oh, um, it was lovely uh, to meet. Well, it's great to meet you. I can't wait to see what you're going to do in the future. And to be honest, uh, I thank you. I love hearing about people that actually bring philosophy into their work because I think we need more of that in the industry across the board. <laughs> so hearing that coming from you and hearing how you've brought literally a lifetime of, of artistic background and inquisitiveness into what you're doing is uh, very inspirational to me. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope we get to connect and talk again. Absolutely. Again, another fantastic conversation. I want to thank our esteemed guest, Avery Pluis, for coming on and being delightful. I want to thank our sponsor, Johnny Incorporated, the most reliable studio service resource for men's clothing to the entertainment industry with over 25 years and 500 productions served. Johnny Incorporated is the suit finder of Hollywood. If Johnny can't find it, no one can. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button, and you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts, also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.